His name is above, his name is above depression. His name is above loneliness. Oh, his name is above disease. His name is above cancer. His name is above every other.
Good morning. I welcome you today as we gather in memory of Wallace Arthur Johnson, or as we know him, our friend Wally. I want to thank you for being here and your support for Fern and Marie and for Ed and their families. I also thank you for your understanding at this time as we are in this season of COVID and its protocols. We appreciate your mindfulness of wearing the mask and, and keeping space between yourselves. So we thank you for that. I'm so thankful that there are more ways to express our love and our care and our concern than just a hug, right? We have the opportunity to continue to reach out, to encourage and to comfort, to share a card, to give a phone call at a time where someone's on our minds, upon our heart, and we can let them know we're praying for them, thinking of them. I encourage you to do that. Today is bittersweet. This is a time of grief and loss. But we know that Wally is with the Lord, whom he loved and he looked forward to see. So we rejoice in the midst of our sorrow. We rejoice that he's with the Lord today. He is well. He no longer battles the, with sin or sickness or the brokenness that life can bring. That is all over. Instead, every tear has been wiped away and he is well. He will never again experience pain or sickness or sorrow for he has fought the good fight and he has finished the race and so for us as we are here today hearts are broken we grieve in our loss allow yourselves to grieve and to do that together and to encourage one another and to support each other and comfort one another for the god of all comfort comforts those who mourn and many times he does it through one another as we show our love and care. It was on the evening of Saturday, December the 25th, Christmas Day, that Wally peacefully entered the presence of his Lord. And as Fern and Marie put it, it was his Christmas present. He was born here in Meaford, November the 5th, 1932, the son of late James and Sadie Nee. McVitie Johnston, beloved husband of Fern, Nee McCathray, uh, and with whom he enjoyed 56 years of happy married life. He was the loving father of Marie Wilson and Ron and Ed Johnston and Carolyn, proud, proud grandfather of Adam and Lucas Johnston, Nathan and Mary, Jonathan, Matthew, and Bethany Wilson, and great-grandfather to Emma. While he was predeceased by his infant son, Stephen, sister Eloise uh, Hoggard, late Maurice, brother Len Johnston, brother-in-law Stan Cathray, sister-in-law Marg Byers, and will be remembered fondly by his many nieces and nephews and their families. Throughout the centuries, people have grieved, people have struggled, and God's people have called on the Lord for help many times. And we see in God's word how he, how he speaks to us and responds to us. And in Isaiah 61 and 3, it says, To console those who mourn in Zion, that he gives them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. What a wonderful exchange of our brokenness, our ashes for beauty. Something only God can do. Jesus said in Matthew 11 and 28, he said, Come to me all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle of heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and, my, and the burden I give you is light. Most of us 
today aren't familiar with a yoke. It's something that would harness two, uh, a team together for plowing or hauling a load of some sort. And this harness would allow them to work together. And you know, we are all harnessed to something in life. Maybe it is work or family. It could be our worries. It could be our fears. There's plenty of that these days. But Jesus is saying if we are willing to team up with him, that he is strong enough to bear the weight of the load that life has put upon us, that we won't be crushed. That's the Lord for us. And we need that today in sorrow, in grief, in loss, all the things that weigh us down. He asks that we can join him. He invites us. And we need his strength today. We're recording this this morning, and it will be also available on YouTube later on this afternoon, and it can be shared with other family members and friends as well. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you. Thank you that you have invited us to join you, you to join us in life, that we can team together, that you can help us in our struggles and carry the weight and the burdens that are so crushing in life. And Father, those that have invited you in are so thankful, Lord, for the way that you do that. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence today. Thank you today that Wally is with you and he is free of his burdens and his struggles. And that, Lord, that he has received his reward, his joy. Father, he has seen you. He is with you today. We thank you for this. But, Lord, as we come and we remember and we celebrate his life Lord, our hearts are broken and saddened this morning, and we acknowledge our need of you today. Would you comfort the hearts of each one we ask in Jesus' name? Would you especially draw near to Fern, Father, in these days? Let her know how close you are, how much you love her, Lord. Hold her in your arms, we pray. Give her hope and strength and courage for each day we ask. Father, draw near to to Marie and Ed and their families, Lord. Comfort them. Lord, we need you, we look to you, and we thank you that you always welcome us, and we respond to you today. Be close to each one, Father, in our grief this morning and in the days ahead. We need your presence with us. Would you bless our time together? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to sing a hymn, and on your seats there, there are handouts, um, these are some of the favorite hymns that, uh, of Wally himself, who, that, and he would sing. And, and so we are going to share in that together. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Thank you, Joan, Joan Anglin, for playing this morning. And the first one we're going to sing today is When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, I'll Be There. Time will be no more, and the morning breaks eternal. 
You may be seated. Wally had many scriptures that he enjoyed many different times. And at this time, we're going to invite Ron Wilson, son-in-law, to come and to share those scriptures with us today. Thank you, Ron. So, Wally had a very keen interest in, this, in, in the Bible. And um, there's, uh, an, in the family, there's an historic New Testament. And he had a, a, a keen interest in eschatology or, or the prophetic words within the scripture. And he used to say, as things are happening in the Middle East, it's all lining up. And I'm not going to go into the prophetic words mentioned about the, the New Testament. Um, Revelation had many lines in it um, highlighted. But I'm not going to read prophetic words this morning. I'm going to read um, several scriptures. The first one, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and, and 18 as well. Um, I thank God... Um, for the, the grace that we had to spend time the last few days of his life where we knew the end was nigh and we could speak blessings and talk many different things. And during that time, he had requested, when I asked him about a scripture to read, um, this particular one. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I'd like to add 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us to the ministry of reconciliation. There's a, a section in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 1 through 7, that I'd like to read as well. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. Wally's faith was very much a part of his everyday life. And I'm forever thankful for that example. His walk with God was a precious one. And I, I thank God that he is now in the arms of the one who loves him more than we can. So I'm going to finish with Psalm chapter 23. Very familiar words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Ron. It was from his favorite version, as I understand, too, the King James Version. And much of what he had learned and studied and memorized came from that. And it's been a blessing to many. Thank you for sharing this morning. In the house of the Lord forever speaks of eternity with God, which has exactly been the theme for Wally, his life, and for even now in the hymns that we sing. We're going to stand to our feet one more time. We're going to sing just over in the glory land. It'll be in the center of your leaflet, and then followed by How Great Thou Art. I behold prepared where the saints abide just over in the glory
Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. As you know, Wally was quite the story teller. Always had stories, didn't he? And they were so often just his life experience, so many of them. But I also thought of different times that he would start to speak in, in, in metaphorically to kind of give us a picture of what he's saying. And that happened in the hospital as I came to see him. And uh, Fern and Marie had just left, and we were just finishing up there, and we read the scriptures, just like that you read. And, and he begins to talk about how he sees himself driving down a road, and as he travels down this road, there is an obstruction of some kind. He, he can't get by a large boulder or something and, he, and as he looks around, he doesn't see a way around it, but he knows there is a road that's just after it. And he's talking about this, and I'm realizing that, you know, is this a story that he's telling, or is there something that you're trying to say? And he says, there have been times when, as I've come to these obstacles, I could see there's another side. I'll keep going down the road. I don't know how, how that's going to work. But I, I know there's a road there. He says, but this time, I don't see the road on the other side. He says, this just leads to a blaze in glory. And I think right then and there from the beginning, as I came to see him in palliative care, that he understood heaven was a very close reality for him. But heaven was something that he thought about often, sang about many times Anytime we'd gather for the 50-plus group, it would always be a song about heaven that he would ask us to sing, and he would talk about it many, many times. Wally was the middle child born to James and Sadie Johnston on November the 5th, 1932, at the early part of the Great Depression. He was born in his home up in Kent. Well, I didn't know where Kent was. They had to explain. That's up on Union Street. And, and that made sense to me. His dad worked at uh, the Knights Flooring uh, Company here in Meaford. And while he attended the Meaford Public School, which was just behind us, as I understand it, at the Godfrey Apartments at that time. But while he didn't like school, I was quite surprised to hear that when I was told. He was such a smart man. I figured he, he would love the learning part. But there was something that just didn't click for Wally. And by the time he entered grade two, he would skip many days in school. <laughs> I thought, boy, he had an early start. <laughs> well, it didn't go unnoticed. And his dad became involved, and he would drive Wally to, to school. And Wally would end up arriving at home before his dad returned back from dropping him off. I don't know how that happened. I don't know if there were stops along the way for his dad. But Wally was determined. If there's anything that we know about Wally is, he was a determined individual. And you know, he may go fishing, he may do whatever he's going to do, but he knew when lunch was, because the, the, the horn or the, that would sound at the Knights of Meaford uh, factory, and he would know it's the lunch hour. But it became challenging when school was out because there was nothing to indicate it was time to go home and he didn't want to arrive too early or too late because he might be caught. Well, 
that ended. We don't know how his dad or the family may have dealt with that. But we do know eventually he got comfortable with school as he got into high school. And, and he enjoyed it. He spoke of it like all of the other students. Different things that, that stood out like, and I didn't know this, they had a tube from the second floor. It was the fire escape. And you would slide down the tube. Well, that would be thrilling for anybody, I'm sure. And, and of course, there was a teacher, Hank Beamer, as I understand it, a science teacher. You know, so he got involved and he got comfortable and he enjoyed it more. And as he came to the end of his high school years, his dad became ill and uh, took a stroke and he helped his mom care for his dad. And it was at this time that he began to work around here. I think that maybe he began first up help building the hospital, which he was a patient at many, many times, and that has blessed our community. And he assisted the bricklayers there. Along the way, he applied for a job at Cardi's Automotive Shop. And as he came in to apply, they asked him, so what do you know? And I can see, I've heard him say this before. He says, I don't know anything about anything. And he got the job. <laughs> he killed that interview. <laughs> And it was while he was working there over, I don't know how long, but his buddy said, hey, let's go to Toronto and find work. And, and so he thought it was a good idea, so they jumped in the car and they headed off to Toronto for the day to find work. And I was thinking, well, you know, like, did he have somewhere to stay? No. Like, what was his plan? I don't know, just look for work. What was he going to do? And, and I'm thinking, you know, he just loved to launch out, and he did. And it didn't work out, actually. He, they didn't find a job. And on their way home, something happened that turned out to be good. They, their car broke down. And so they pulled into the Ford dealership. And I thought this would be a timely place for someone to say something about a Ford vehicle. But they pull in there. They, they buy the part. And in the parking lot, they fix the vehicle. And as they're fixing the vehicle in the parking lot at the Ford dealership, as the staff are looking out at these two young men, they're thinking, we should hire these guys. And they got a job there while they're repairing the car. Well, Wally ended up finding room and board with a couple, a European couple. One was German, one was Polish. And as he would sit at the dinner table with them, they would speak in German in their private conversation. Wally didn't know German, but eventually began to respond. And it, um, it startled them that he began to understand, so they switched to Polish, and that was the end of that. <laughs> but I think that experience of going to Toronto might have been the start of, an, of a life of adventure, or the chronicles of, of Wally. And he's done a lot of things in his life, and I'm going to invite uh, Marie, Wilson, and then Ed, unless you guys are going to come differently, and uh, they're going to come and they're going to share their reflection of their father. Thank you, Marie. Well, what came to mind for me actually jumps a little bit further ahead in the story. So I don't know what Ed's going to include, but most of you know that, that Dad spent a few years up north. And, uh, you know, and if, we, if we miss some of it, that's, that's okay too. But he spent a few years up north, up in Hay River. They were building Diefenbaker roads up there, and, and so he was part of the crew. He helped to fix the machinery while they were building the roads. And, uh, what, has, what came to my mind is when he came back south from the north and uh, he was living with his mother. So while he was up north, he found this New Testament. And uh, for a time, he was the only man in, in an 80-man camp. Everybody else had gone south for the winter, and he was looking after the place until they came back to continue the work in the spring. And he found this New Testament. And he thought it'd be a great joke to give it back to the guy it belonged to, give him back his Bible. So he you know, held on to it. But he's up there by himself, 80-man camp, over the winter. And this was reading material. 
So he would read at it from time to time. Well, he gets back south. He's living with his mother, drawing on employment. And uh, he said, in, the, in them days, he said, they didn't let you draw on employment. They found you a job. So he wound up working at Russell Brothers in Own Sound, and then they built ships there. So he met a couple of guys there, Fred Vincent and Cliff Wilson from the Pentecostal Church in Own Sound. And some of you may remember some of these characters. Um, and they used to talk to him and invite him to church. And eventually he started coming and came to faith in Jesus. I don't know the particulars of that story, but uh, Mom was saying the other night when we were here with Pastor Dan that Uncle Lauren said that there was a kindness that came into Dad when he got saved, which, which I found interesting. I don't, I don't know what he was like before, but that was a really interesting observation. So he'd be driving to midweek prayer meeting, and there'd be this tidy little number walking up the street. And so the next week, he's driving to prayer meeting, midweek prayer meeting, and there's this tidy little number walking up the street. So he, he decided he was going to fix her, and he took a different route. So he approaches the church in a different way, and there's this tidy little number walking up the street. She was there, too. And she, of course, Mom had, that was Mom, and she had no idea what, uh, of all this. She was just going to prayer meeting. And when, uh, when she got there, or when he got there, she was there too. So he's walking her, watching her walk up the street, and then there she is. So most of these uh, stories are, are things that I remember him saying in testimony time, Sunday night church. So the, these weren't the stories that came out around the dinner table. Those were more the stories from up north and, and memories of his childhood. But these particular ones would come out when we were growing up and on... Uh, in Sunday night testimony time and then Sunday night service. Well, so the people in the church noticed this and, and started trying to set them up. And one story involves a sleigh ride. Dad had a nice new car, lots of room in it. Some of the young people needed rides to the sleigh ride. So he had a full load on the way out. But on the way back, there was just her. And, and he points to mom, it's just her. So and eventually, Dad worked up the courage to ask her out. And, and he says, and, and, and she came. So as they were getting to, to know one another, there's, I don't know a lot of that, but one of the stories Dad used to tell was, was about a coworker whose daughter Florence was in the hospital. And so her dad would call the hospital at lunchtime to see how Florence was. And, uh, and then he'd come back, and he would tell the guys, would tell Dad how Florence was. Well, when he and Mom would be together in, in the evening, Mom would ask him, how's Florence? And he would tell her, give her the report. It wasn't until later that Mom found, or that Dad found out, that Mom was Florence's nurse. It was probably Mom that Florence's dad was talking to. So for, for Dad, that told him that he could trust her. And, and that was important to him. He didn't trust everybody in his life, but that told him that he could trust her. So the point came where mom and dad were engaged, but they hadn't set a date yet. And mom had it all settled. She'd, dad was the right man. She'd settled it in prayer. She had asked an older lady who she trusted to hear from God to um, pray. And, and she had come back, this, this older lady had come back to mom and had said, an older man will treat you like a queen. Now, dad's a few years older than mom and, and she was a bit concerned at that point. He was in his early 30s, she was in her early 20s. Was, was this okay? But that helped to settle her as well. An older man will treat you like a queen. But dad, on the other hand, he used to come to his decisions slowly. At least that was the man that I knew. It, he wanted to look at all the angles, make sure that it was the right thing, didn't want to miss anything. And uh, this was a big decision. So he put out a fleece. Now, the idea of a fleece, we get that from, from Judges chapters 6 to 8 in the Bible. That's where the, the story is. And uh, so he said later he didn't think it was the best way of getting guidance 
from God, but that's, that's what he did. And so his fleece was that if normally the minister will come to, or normally the couple will go to the minister and ask to, if, they would marry, if, if he would marry them. Well, what dad's fleece was, was that the minister would come to them and ask if he could marry them. And dad set a date on it. You know, it had to happen by a certain time, if, if this was really God, if this was really the right thing. So mom's all settled. She, she knows this is good, but, but dad's still waiting for the final confirmation. So the time, deadline's getting closer and closer, and then one Sunday evening, dad drops mom off for choir practice before the service, and he's standing in the entryway of the church. Well, the pastor comes whipping out from the sanctuary to go to the downstairs, and on his way by, he says, hey, when are you and Fern getting married? And so Dad uh, uh, wanted to talk to you about that. And so the rest is history. We know where that went. So this New Testament, it was, it was precious to Dad. This was the Bible that he carried to church with him. It was always in his suit pocket, and... and if it was a New Testament scripture, he would pull it out. And, uh, and actually, that's where it was when I asked Mom about it. It was in the jacket he'd last worn to church. So when I was about 12, um, Dad was asked to be the guest speaker at a, at a youth group meeting, a midweek youth group meeting. And most of what he said, I don't remember. But he would have given his testimony, the story of his life. And I do remember him reading Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And as I remember it, his point was that when he came to faith in Jesus and began to seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that was when things really began to work in his life. He met mom, he got married, they purchased a home, he got a good job, and they raised a family. And he considered these to be the things that God had added to him. Well, first off, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. Um, I appreciate everyone that came. Um, and uh, also, uh, Joanna and the group from uh, Ferguson's Funeral Home, you've been fantastic. Um, Pastor Dan, I know you've been an integral part in Dad's uh, and the Cook Street community here, an integral part in their lives for as long as I can remember, So, um, which unfortunately is getting more years as I look at the calendar. Um, and uh, just to my sister and Ron, thanks for uh, looking after Dad in his last couple of years. And to everybody attending online, which is fantastic that during COVID that we can actually do this, that it's forced us to uh, seek other alternatives. So as Pastor Dan mentioned, Dad was born on November 5th, 1932. Um, which is a, also a special date for me as well because that was the date that I was uh, actually adopted and uh, brought home to Meaford. So um, it, as Dad would say, it was a, a special day for him. It was a special birthday present. So it's ironic that that date happened as well. The irony of the, the, him passing away on Christmas Day will also be something that I was saying to my family that... Uh, we can now not only just celebrate Christmas, we'll be able to celebrate uh, the life of Dad. So, um, <clears throat> and it was I also, Dad, Dad had a way of doing things. So, as Pastor Dan mentioned, he was he passed away in um, Meaford General Hospital, just up on the top of the hill here. But he was also part of the crew that built the hospital. So he was a, a bricklayer's helper, which. In his younger years, if you were ever a bricklayer's helper, you know that that wasn't a fun job. 
So, um, and like he said, he attended school in town here, but it wasn't a focus for him. School was never a big thing, but he went to school in town and eventually made his way to, uh, to various parts down the street here, working at Cardi's, um, went to Toronto, got his apprenticeship, and I was talking to Dad, just goes to show what kind of character Dad had. Um, he, uh, he did his apprenticeship for somebody in Toronto, and he did, he up and, well, I guess he wouldn't up and left, but he, he left to go from Toronto to Newfoundland where he worked out there, but he told me, which I never knew, um, when I was visiting him in the past couple weeks, I got him telling stories because that wasn't a hard thing to do. Um, he was telling me that he never actually finished his apprenticeship, that he never got his full hours in, but because he was such a good person, I guess, the person that he was working for actually signed off on his hours. So he actually became a class A mechanic uh, with this gentleman. So, um, but one of the things dad made sure he did when he came back from Newfoundland to, he made a special visit to the gentleman in Brampton and thanked him for that, um, which goes just to show the character dad had. Um, and, uh, and then he went, he made his way to the Northwest Territories where Again, dad being typical storytellers, we would often hear of stories of various things like um, him being up there by himself and he'd go fishing and catch a fish, but there would, uh, back then they wouldn't have probably any fridges or anything up there. So he had to actually store the fish on top of his trailer because he was afraid if you didn't leave it on top of the trailer, you'd have uh, a friendly bear would come and say hello and uh, your dinner would be gone. So... Um, but there was a lot of, a lot of stories like that, but eventually, like I said, we made his way back to Owen Sound where he worked at the tank range. So he worked in the tank range, but lived in Owen Sound with mom. They had an apartment when they first got married, but so he was driving back and forth and then they eventually moved to Meaford, but then he got a job at PVG. So he was driving from Meaford to Owen Sound. So it didn't quite make sense to me that he was, he moved from own sound to Meaford and then got a job vice versa so it was always as kids we always heard Marie would always I, know, I was always here that it was in the five-year plan everything was in the five-year plan to to move to own sound or it, he would eventually even even jobs that it came up around the house that he wanted to get done he would just his go-to response was it's in the five-year plan so whether it was to fix the barn or, or whatever the case was, it's in the five-year plan. So that was always his go-to response. Um, and then eventually, uh, so he made the drive from me for Don't Sound every day um, because the five-year plan never came to fruition. We never did move to Don't Sound. Um, so, but when he retired, he retired uh, with a status. He was, uh, his clock number or his seniority number was number two in the plant. So... He often told me that, uh, well, um, unless the place closes down, he's not losing his job because he was number two. So he figured he was okay for job seniority, that he, he wasn't going to lose his job. But uh, when he retired, he, he went from being, he said he went from being number two at PPG to being number two on the 15-16 because uh, mom was the boss. So, but he had, he had a calm demeanor. Dad had a calm demeanor about him that, just, uh, um, I think it was infectious. So um, it's funny, uh, Carolyn's uh, sister made a comment uh, to me um, when she was texting back and forth, uh, passing along condolences, that now she sees where I get my calm demeanor from. So it's obviously from, from dad, but he had a way of taking things and just thinking it out. Like for instance, we, we would often, we had a, a tin boat that was a, a pretty good sized tin boat that we would store at the property up on the 1516 and come winter time, um, dad would often, we'd, we'd say, okay, well, we're going to flip the boat so it doesn't fill up with snow and make sure it doesn't fill up with water so it doesn't wreck it for the winter. So we would make uh, arrangements to make a visit and uh, there'd be, uh, we'd say, okay, well, we're coming up this such and such a date. So we get up there and I said, okay, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna flip the boat. We'll get it flipped for the winter so it's, it doesn't fill up. So of course, when we got there, 
Um, Dad had had time to think about everything. So in the process of this, because he thought everything out methodically and everything else, Dad was very, let's do things the easy way, um, not, the, not the most difficult way. So instead of us breaking our backs, trying to flip this boat over, um, he had methodically thought, okay, he's, he's got this engine hoist. He's going to lift up the engine hoist. Uh, we're going to put straps underneath, lift the boat up, um, put these uh, pieces of wood underneath, and then uh, methodically he had it all, like he was just like the, uh, the conductor in an orchestra because at this point in time he wasn't, uh, he wasn't much for the physical labor, but he was uh, certainly good at giving instructions, that's for sure. Um, so he told, uh, I think it was Ron and myself, we, we strapped everything up and flipped it over, but that was just the kind of thing that he did. So um, it, whenever I would call him, I knew that I could get the easy answer on how to do things. Um, if there was a problem that I was having or whether I was trying to figure something out, I, I knew I could call him and he would tell me how to figure it out. Um, and also just to his character, there were so many things that he did just without hesitation, being a good father. Um, like building, built me an ice rink as a kid. I never knew how to skate, but all of a sudden he had built an ice rink for me. Um, and this wasn't back in the day where you could go to Home Depot and just buy an ice rink kit. Um, so he actually had to get out there. He got out there, we had this scoop shovel. He filled it up and I think I remember actually sitting in this thing so it had weight in it and he dragged it across the backyard, flattened out the snow and then um, there was no plastic or anything like that so then he would, then next came the water. So, um, which was a big thing too because we were on a well system so there was always the threat of us losing water so um, for him to go out and uh, make an ice rink for me was a, was a big thing and also just the things that he taught me over the years, like fixing my bicycle as a kid, as I got older, um, I, I might not have, uh, I, I was a little adventurous when I was a kid, so I would be out and about, and uh, next thing you know, I'd come home with a flat tire, because well, who knows how that happened, but anyway, I'd come home with a flat tire, and, and he showed me how to fix a flat tire by taking it off, how to get the tire off the rim, and everything else, and uh, rubbing, rubbing the, the tube down and everything else. Well, next thing you know, before that, there was, if anybody had a flat tire in the neighborhood, they knew they could come to me. There was, there was a few times that I fixed flat tires for the kids in the neighborhood because dad had taught me how. So, um, and certain other things like Jerry Klebine lived down the street and somehow I ended up, I don't know how in my negotiations, I guess that's why I'm in sales now. Um, I ended up with a go-kart frame nothing more than a frame and it had four wheels. And I showed up at the house with this go-kart frame and of course, dad was like, well, what are you gonna do with that? Well, I, I of course thought it might be a good idea if we had a go-kart. So next thing you know, dad being the innovative guy that he is, probably put a lot of thought into it. There's a, there's a lawnmower engine going on there and there's a brake and he's got a, he's got a throttle figured out and with a, with a threaded rod and everything else. And, Next thing you know, I'm in the hit of the neighborhood because I've got a, a running go-kart that he manufactured basically from nothing. So, um, Teaching me other things, there was all kinds of other things that he taught me over the years and, and just the things that he did for me that I'll look back and I'll appreciate because even on my first car, it was always one of those things that I never, I, I took for granted because he would... I would have a car, this car that I bought, and I'm sure he just shook his head when I bought this beater of a Mustang, but it was a Mustang, and Mustangs back in the day were kind of a cool car, so I thought it would be a good idea to have this, but I didn't realize that, okay, well, it needed fuel lines and brakes and everything else, so, of course, I left that to Dad, and it just miraculously got done. Like, I'd come home one day, and, yeah, okay, your car's fixed. Like, it was those kinds of things that Dad did for me that, I, I often took for, took for granted, but now I appreciate that he did all those things for me because it was just in his nature to do those kinds of things. Um, even, like, even to this day, he would still, there would be a lot of things that he would still look after me and, 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 I, and I'm a grown man now. So we would, we would park our, Carol and I, we'd park our trailer at the, at the property um, up on the hill. And, 
even with that, I'd take the battery out for the winter and I'd come back in the spring and of course my battery was fully charged, ready to go. And he'd have things laid out for me so that it was all ready to go. But that was just his way of still looking after me to this day. And even the other little things, um, we had a wood pile at our house, ironically, um, but we don't have a wood stove. So for some reason, this wood pile was always full and he knew that I would help myself to wood um, for campfires and for camping and everything else. But it was never, it was never just, again, just to show his, his character. It was never one of those things that it was always there. He just, it was just second nature to him. That, and even kindling. He had these bundles of kindling that he's got in these sheds. And every time I would, I would take one to go camping. And every time I would come back, there would always be another kindling. But I'm like, Dad, you don't have a fire pit. Well, that's okay. It gives me something to do. And he'd make these bundles of kindling for me. And, and to this day, I still think, okay, well, he was doing that for me. Um, and uh, just, it was, those were the type of things that he did. And that was just the type of man that he was. He would do things without hesitation. Um, but the, the beauty of it is I, I had the opportunity to call him on anything mechanical that I ever I ever needed a, so I basically had the best of both worlds because I had him, my dad, to call me for anything mechanical, and I was fortunate. I also had my father-in-law, um, Fred, who I could call on for anything business. So I had a great balance between the two that I had dad for anything mechanical and I had Fred for anything business, um, and hopefully some of that falls through on my sons. I can see it a little bit now that Lucas is a little more mechanical. Adam, not so much, even though he's in school for engineering, um, not so much on the mechanical, so, um, but maybe that might come someday. Um, and, and mom and dad have often, they've lived in the community for a long time. Like Marie said, they've, they moved here in 56, 66, I'm trying to date them, 66 they moved, so, um, but it, I was often proud to say I was Wally Johnson's son. Um, because I knew he was respected by so many people and just as an example I worked at a wheelbarrow factory in town here when I was 17 or 18 and one of the gentlemen I worked with he was my foreman I said oh I'm got the job and I said, oh, I'm, I'm Wally Johnson's son. He goes, oh, I know Wally. I, I worked with him um, back, I don't, I don't know where. It was Bob, I can't, I, and his last name uh, fails me right now. But uh, um, so I had instantaneous recognition because of my dad, because everybody knew Wally Johnson. So as the story goes, uh, I was there. I was a young kid. I was 18 year old. I was probably one of the younger guys there. Um, it was just a, basically a summer job for me before I went off to school. And, uh, well, it turns out they needed a welder because uh, our welder, uh, he got paid on Thursdays and sometimes didn't like to show up on Fridays because he had a pocket full of money. So they needed a welder. We had to get these jobs done. So I guess we got talking around the table, and uh, next thing you know, I said, oh, I was a welder. And Bob says, oh, how do you know how to weld? I said, well, my dad taught me how. Um, okay, well, next thing you know, I was, I was the welder. So I, I went from being uh, the kid that had to do all the punching and all these parts to being uh, the welder that uh, they actually asked me to stay on. And I said, no, I have to go to school. But um, it was just that kind of stuff that we, even though we'd, we'd meet people various times, Carol and I and the boys, we'd be camping. And, and we often, quite often camped in town here, um, down at the beach at Memorial Park. And We'd get talking to people and we would say, oh, who do you, like, who's your parents? And it'd be Wally and Fern Johnson. Well, of course, uh, the more times, I don't know how many times we could count on our hands, but there was so many times that, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we know Wally Johnson. Um, and even, even Carol and I purchased a property this summer uh, in just uh, over an old sound as a, as a cottage property. And <laughs> we got a, a, a nice plant on our front uh, front deck whenever we arrived uh, from the neighbors just to say welcome to the neighborhood well it turns out we go down and we go to say thank you to them and we get talking away and 
And I, he says, oh, Carolyn mentioned, oh, he's from Meaford. He goes, oh, yeah, where are you from? I says, I don't know if you know the road in Meaford. He goes, well, give me a try. And I said, well, I used to live on the 1516. He goes, yeah, well, the only people I know on the 1516 are Wally and Fern Johnson. So there again, so turns out it's uh, Brian Wood and we're related. So um, imagine that being related to some Parker in town. But uh, um, things like that, even, even uh, we ran in, uh, so that's on mom's side, but on the other side, we, uh, Carolyn, um, for the, her gift of the gab, there'd be somebody walking by on the street and she quite often, it gives her, a, I think it gives her a, um, a break from uh, doing work, but um, she'll be walking by and sure enough, uh, she's talking to this person and finds out, okay, yeah, we're from Meaford and we know so-and-so and it turns out to be uh, David Lawrence, who's uh, uh, Laurie and Mel's uh, uncle. So again, somebody else and then this, just as uh, winter's coming around, we're thinking, okay, well, we need to get somebody for the, to blow the snow because, um, Murray, I wasn't going to make you drive all the way to Old Town. So um, we need to get someone to blow the snow. Well, we get talking to this gentleman, and he, again, background information, and, well, who's your dad? And I find out, oh, your dad's Wally Johnson. Oh, I know Wally. I worked with him at PPG for years. So just stuff like that. It was, he knew everybody. Everybody knew of him, and he was well-respected within the community. Um, and I know, it, just with the stories, I know Carol and Adam and Lucas, um, they often will, that'll be something that we'll always remember because he was always full of stories and, and it would just, it seemed to perk him up whenever he would tell a story and it was just a, a regular occurrence during the dinner meal. Even when we were young kids, it was, I think most families probably once you're done eating, you get up and you start to clean up. Well, not our family. We would wait for dad to spin another tale about whether it be, I can't remember the guy, Sam or like a Sam stories that he had from a guy at work that was kind of the, um, I, I don't know, he was the kind of the character at work and, and stories about the Northwest Territories, which was a big, uh, a big integral part in his life or just any, he had all kinds of stories that he'd love to tell and he'd tell, he'd tell it with such a enthusiasm, but he also had a way of putting a spin of humor on it that you didn't, he didn't realize he was trying to tell a joke until it actually came out, and he was just very subtle about it. So um, uh, that's one thing that we'll definitely miss about Dad is, is all his stories. But I'll definitely, one, one, just in closing, I, I hope that I can be as good a father um, as he was to me, as I can be to my boys. Thank you. Thank you, Marie and Ed, for sharing your life stories with your dad. He truly was a man that has blessed many, many lives. And I know even here at the church how much he was appreciated and respected. And as he would come to the men's ministry breakfast or dinner or whatever it was, and the, we'd have our discussions, and occasionally he would share a story, and he would share his wisdom, and he had such wealth and life experience and everybody just enjoyed what he had to say they appreciated him and he was a special guy he was a man of adventure and he created adventure as i listen to your stories you have stories because you went on an adventure with wally as he included you in his life and you have stories today because of him and you know as marie you mentioned that um when he gave his heart to the Lord, there was a change. And I remember many times him quoting from memory, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And I would remember how it would just all of a sudden come on out. And it changed his life because he knew he was a child of God. And that was his adventure. As health became un, uh, unpredictable, maybe, up and down, the Lord was his adventure. The Lord's blessings were his adventure. And you look forward to the completion of that adventure, or the next step, shall I say, because eternity is an adventure with God.
You will forever spend eternity discovering God and all that he has for you. What an adventure, and he looked forward to it. It reminds me of that trip to Toronto. Doesn't know what it's going to look like on the other end, but let's go. And it reminds me of how he looked at heaven. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I don't know, but I can't wait to go. It's going to be great. And that was him. And if you are related to him in any way, I am confident that he prayed for you at some point in his life, praying that you would know the Lord and find the adventure that he can bring to your own life and for eternity. Because that's the kind of man that he was. He was confident of this. And we can be confident as well. We're going to conclude with the singing of Amazing Grace. And I'm going to invite Joan to come. But let's just bow in prayer. Father, we want to thank you today. We thank you as we pause to reflect upon Wally and Lord, the way he touched so many lives, touched our lives. Whether it be a seedling tree that he passed along to be planted on a property, whether it's a go-kart that he helped repair, whether it's a story that he shared. Lord, so many ways he's left a mark. And Father, we thank you that you left a mark upon him that has caused us to be marked by you through him. And so, Father, we thank you today. And Father, as we reflect and as we go into life, Father, we want to continue to remember, we want to continue to celebrate, we want to continue to be inspired, we want to continue to be touched. And Father, we pray that you would help us in this time. And that Jesus, that our lives would be marked mostly by you, whom, whom Wally loved so much, and who he looked forward to be with, and he is today. And so, Jesus, we welcome you. Have your way in our lives. May you carry the load of our life as we team with you and you with us in the burdens that we face. We thank you for your precious love and the hope that you give. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's sing the very first and last verse of Amazing Grace. You can stand to your feet. We're going to be traveling to the Lakeview Cemetery here in Meaford just shortly. You'll have an opportunity there at the graveside to share of your own personal uh, thoughts, uh, remarks there, some way that you appreciate Wally, what he's done, what you, how, how you think of him, and to encourage one another in that. And we'll do that later on. You are welcome to join us there. But let's sing Amazing Grace verses 1 and 4 together. Oh, yes. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved us. Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17 says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us by and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope. Comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. May the Lord bless you.
Welcome to this inspirational teaching by Pastor Brian You are here. You're 
you go.